So we're just going to take a look inside this Electro Harmonic Super Ego pedal, check out the build quality, and I guess just have a discussion of the more complex digital pedals in general. So pretty standard setup for Electro Harmonics. Graphic, I would say is subjective. I really don't like this particular graphic, but you know, there is a distinct sort of style with a lot of the modern uh, and the vintage Electro Harmonics pedals. It's got that nice thick paint job on the outside and then you know the the paint on top is is obviously well done and it's their i forget this in, the name of this enclosure size but they do a lot of pedals in this sort of form factor same size as the pog 2 and the modern deluxe memory man and plenty of others so taking a look at the inside now we've got some nice simple foot switches single pole single throw i guess i kind of find it funny how they use these ribbon connectors for no no sorry they you because they use pcbs to make two solder connections so you've added i'm not sure what the purpose is here maybe they maybe it depends on maybe the ribbon cable is machine soldered to the pcbs in bulk and they're, they're cut off i'm not too sure but it does seem odd to solder twice when i would solder sort of twice as much as you needed to when it's really only two joints there you know you'd normally just take one wire there another wire there anyway and then they've done that for each one i mean i don't know maybe I don't, i'm sure there's something in the production that i am not privy to you know i had no idea about how they make pedals like this really so our uh, standard board mounted jacks mostly smt components apart from the power supply here that's everything you'd expect to see inside a pedal like this it seems like the general design is like they'll have usually one or three foot switches down the bottom here and then they normally just you know give themselves the whole upper area for the pcb with these cutouts for the top screws there as i said before i do like how they get the whole square I would be interested to know how they do that because it means that it just looks a bit better with the power jack there. It, I mean, if they could even figure out how to get it flush with the edge, that would be spectacular. Sort of similar grounding scheme to the last video here. We've got that scraped off paint section and then some speed fins sticking out of the PCB. Who knows? Interesting to note the analog devices chip in use on these. So. That will bring us into a broader discussion, perhaps. So yeah, got big hunk and chip there. A few other smaller ones. I did reflow some of the solder. I've seen this on electro harmonics pedals before. Some of the solder was terrible, as in there was almost none there on certain joins. And I've seen this on maybe a deluxe memory man in the past, commonly on the ribbon connector joints. So maybe it's machine done somehow. I don't know. No, you know, normally like these joints would be hand soldered. Obviously the SMT components are done, you know, pick and placed, but the, um, these, sorry, the jack soldering would be hand and probably, probably these caps and the DC jack. So the reason I bring up the chip in this is that it in, is interesting to um, think about which companies of the bigger, you know, the bigger players use which chips. And I found a really interesting article that I'll link in the description. Basically gives a excellent sort of rundown of which company uses what. So from Strymon, who use the Shark chips as well, I think a different one to the one in this pedal. And Source Audio, um, so you've got Strymon, Meris, Source Audio, and several others, uh, Empress, Electro Harmonics, Chase Bliss. But yeah, I'll link to this article and this uh, video, which was also very interesting, which was about the Spin FV1 chip. So what I've got here is the FV1 development board. These are actually kind of hard to get hold of uh, at the moment just because the spin chips are a little bit short. I mean, they're, they're around, I think. Just, they're expensive as well. Uh, they seem to have gone up in price a bit. But this is basically, you know, it's an audio board. You can, you can process audio with it, but it's mainly so that you can learn to program the spin FV1 chip on there. So it's got a regular style USB-B port. can be USB bus powered or powered. Uh, it's actually positive tip from the jack there. And you've got, it's not quarter inch, but it's still got analog audio, stereo in and out with RCA jacks. And you've also got three uh, controls. So, you know, these sort of flat, they're, they're pots, basically. They're just 
don't look that normal, but you can control three of the FV1 parameters with those, and you can load your, your programs directly over the USB and change programs with the selector here. So it's a pretty cool board. Um, the only problem is that the software support is a little bit defunct. Well, it's never been a Mac OS thing, but I've been struggling to get it running on my Windows virtual machine. Uh, I've tried using Wine or Crossover to run the software. It actually runs fine and it, it runs fine in Crossover slash Wine. It also runs fine in Parallels uh, Windows 11, but I can't connect to the USB. I'm thinking it might be a hardware issue uh, to do with using the USB to connect through a Thunderbolt port. I don't really know, but uh, I'm going to try just an older Windows computer and hopefully get that working because the software is um, still pretty cool. Uh, I, I know nothing about programming really, but it'll be nice to learn um, and try and, you know, just try and make like a, a rudimentary digital pedal of some sort. Yeah, once you sort of get looking into this topic, it does get quite interesting because, you know, I was scratching my head as to why this is the only way to make your own digital pedals, or so, it's, so it seems, because essentially all of the other larger what seems to be the roadblock is that the larger chip manufacturers analog devices being the main one apparently the visual dsp plus plus software that you need to i believe compile and, and write and program their chips costs about 3500 us dollars for a license which is why it's sort of perfectly feasible for the bigger companies, but the smaller pedal companies tend to just go for the FV1. They're probably bigger now, like Catlin Bread and Earthquaker. When they first started making digital pedals, they couldn't just fork out $3,500 for that development software. So they went with the FV1 and they made some awesome pedals on that uh, platform, especially, uh, so Jack DeVille, who I've mentioned before, I've seen him post on the gear page about FV1 a bit and how you can do a lot with it. Uh, apparently you can get more than three parameters out of the chip. He must have some special way of doing that, but it, it's cool to know that we'll see what we can get up to with this. I'm not too sure, um, but hopefully, you know, you, it can do pitch reverb delay so it will certainly be interesting to see what sort of results i can get out of it anyway that's really all i've got to say for now i'm going to link the guitar pedal dsp 101 a look at the chips being put to work in modern digital effects pedals by mike c june 16 2020 it's a noise gate article i'll link that below uh definitely worth a read if any of this stuff interests you and um there's also a pretty interesting forum thread on the gear page or sorry gear space as it's now known with some responses from sean costello who's the valhalla dsp guy i believe just talking about how he used to work at ua and analog devices and it's all yeah it's all quite interesting stuff anyway this is what i'm going to try and get up to if i can get it to connect to a computer that would be excellent and then i hopefully can make something fun and that was the inside of the Electro Harmonics Super Ego Plus. It's a demo video of this that I'll link below.